Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Let's Learn StarCraft. We just got done with Zerg vs. Zerg Core Strategy. We looked at a nice, long, juicy example game. And now we're going to look at a whole bunch of different openings. Think about the strategic advantages these openings should give, and therefore what tactics we can deploy to finish this game up. This game is... this is an important game for me. Um, this is Li Jiedong uh, winning... Uh, the OSL. This is the grand final where he is up against yellow ARNC. And this is a particularly meaningful series for me because Jadong absolutely dominated. It is the most one-sided finals in the history of um, the OSL and the MSL. But also because yellow ARNC afterwards, he was so close to winning. Later, he fell into what many StarCraft professionals did and did match fixing, where he would throw matches for money <laughs> which of course is someone who uh you know i've talked about this a lot as someone who uh you know had my social struggles growing up with bullying and not feeling like i fit in the place where i felt like i fit in was like team liquid and around starcraft people and around starcraftly things and these are the people that i really looked up to and so it always it just stings when I think about how many good Zerg players like Yellow and like Savior were match fixers at the time. So I'm delighted to show you Jadong absolutely mollywomping the shit out of Yellow ARNC. Um, so this player, um, we, we, we will heretofore refer to as Yarncy because his name was Yellow ARNC, like this. So people would abbreviate that Yarncy. So, um... In this game, this map is Holy World, which, well, first of all, you see the pentagram in the middle. Ah! But you've heard me talk quite a bit about maps that have inverted ramps. This map has two significant tactical considerations for Zerg vs. Zerg. First of all, inverted ramps. Fighting up or down any ramp just sucks for the person on the bottom. Having Zerglings on the top is way stronger than having Zerglings on the bottom, so it's very easy to contain your opponent on the high ground. Um, and also, this main base is not shoved up into a corner. If you look at many maps, main bases, like on Fighting Spirit, are sort of like pressed up against the top sides. So you only have to worry about the southern and eastern flank, but here, this is really open. So let's look at this um, opening out of Jadong. We're not even really going to look too much at Yarnsey this game, but Jadon does a very, very intelligent play. Very intelligent consideration here. So, uh, what we're going to see out of Yarnsey, because I'm the master at structuring the uh, flow of games, you, we've seen several nine pool games in a row, and we're going to see that same thing out of Yarnsey in the southern position. But here, Jadon does something interesting. He builds. Whoops, I thought I paused it right at the right time. But no. Jadong has too much APM in this replay. Builds an extractor, builds a drone, cancels the extractor so that he is at 10 out of 9 supply. And then moves out here to build a hatchery. In the meantime, we see the 9 pool opening. Pool on 9, gas on 9, overlord on 8, drone on 8. Same old, same old. So, hatchery on 10, pool on 9, build a drone, gas on 9, do we build another drone? Yeah. And then following all of this, a single overlord. Okay. What are the advantages that these players have? Very clearly, Jadong has the larva advantage. This is as fast of a hatchery as you can physically build. The pool's coming out at a reasonable-ish time. The gas is coming out at a reasonable-ish time. Eight lings getting made, drones following up. We're seeing Yarnsey doing essentially the identical build to um, Hero in the last two games that we saw in the core strategy. But here, Jadong, there's something very interesting to note that happens here. Once Jadong is able to get Zergling speed, he pulls everything off mining. Because Jadong only has nine drones. This is, I think, a very important opening lesson to begin with. Because this build 
is all about getting a ton of zerglings and trying to win with just zerglings. And if you get an early hatchery, you have to appreciate how little money you have to do anything else. We're going to see that in this game. So first of all, how does Jadong deal with zerglings arriving to his base so quickly? Jadong just gets a shitload of zerglings so quickly. So Jadong literally just shows up to the fight. Yarnsi gets a much better arc, but Jadong doesn't care because he's producing lings two at a time. Jadong's getting pretty fast zergling speed. Yarnsi has not... Uh, I think Yarnsi has it done. No, Yarnsi has actually canceled his zergling speed, which is an interesting choice. Uh, and not, I think, an unintelligent one. Yarnsi's basically going, Oh, dude, I am, I'm literally abandoning the battle on the Zergling front. There's no reason to even try to fight you with Zergling speed. What I need to do is do something Spire-focused. So, I mean, if you're uh, Yarnsi here, you can actually just go Sunken Colony. Sunken Colony to try to hold off this very likely never-ending onslaught of Zerglings. And I think that this is an excellent excellent build selection from Jadong on this map because of this inverted ramp. Because of this huge, wide-open main base. What is the advantage Jadong is trying to leverage right now? Just having extra larva. Whoops, I whiffed that. I meant to pause. I'm so sorry. Yarnsi's going to try to set up a little hold position setup here at the ramp, but I mean, Jadong... Sees, breaks in. Starts trying to harass. Sunken Colony's almost up. And here's where, if you're playing, you shouldn't panic. So, in terms of listing off the openings... I mean, this was so fast to list off, man. It's, it's literally Extractor Trick, then Hatchery, and then a Pool on 9, and then a Gas on 9, and then an Overlord on 9. Get speed, pull off gas, never stop building circlings. All right, crap. We are in trouble, right? Jeez, this guy is, we, doesn't look like we can break him. Well, big mistake, very easy to make. If you are green, marching in right now. Trying to end the game right now. You can poke like this, but watch what Jadong does. Oh, he pulls back, damn it. Oh, he pulls back. Isn't it glorious? I love watching a grown man pull back. Because Jadong wants to maximize his larva advantage for as long as possible before Mutalisks pop out. So when do you really need to attack by? Well, you need to attack a little, just a little bit after the spire is done. Because now a Mutalisk can get started. And you can easily count the larva. Like, it's so funny. There, there's some things, like, you know, especially as I'm learning Dota. Um, reminds me a lot of really funky little tricks that you can do in StarCraft to gain extra edges. And counting larva sounds like one of those really crazy, sophisticated things. But, I mean, literally... Move Zerglings here, see if they become eggs. If the Spire isn't done, those are not Mutalisks. You can get a very, very easy, clean count <laughs> of exactly how many Mutalisks are coming up when. So here, Jadong is able to swing in from multiple angles. He's able to slip through here. And he's striking literally right before this Mutalisk comes up. I really think the only essential fundamental mistake that Yarnsi made was not building a second sunken colony. And I honestly think that if I were to build a sunken colony right here, blocking off this mineral patch completely, because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mineral patches with one drone going on the outside, that's fine. I only need seven or so. Um, and if you're Jadong and you're encountering this, and you can't get through, well, you do what Jadong's doing back home, right? Jadong's just doing all-in insurance. I'm going all-in right now, and I'm just going to build one creep colony by my drones. Why no second creep colony here? There's no drones. Very good. Okay, build it just by the drones. 
And what would Jadong rely upon if this attack didn't work? How would Jadong continue to grow from here? Jadong would just build creep colonies and zerglings and rally ho. Quick, simple, nice little game about exploiting larva advantage. Um, I want to show another one that is less extreme about exploiting larva advantage from everyone's favorite Jeff in control. Let's go ahead and open up the holiday bash replays. Jeff did this weird ass opening. I, I don't even recommend it. It's it's so weird. However, everything that Jeff does with it is exactly how you should control with um, exactly how you should manage your advantages. So here we have Barristan the Bold, aka In Control. And In Control is going to do a wild ass opening. And I want to go into this wild ass opening because um, it's, it's actually pretty good on pub games and ladder because most people don't really know how to deal with it. Um, but also because it's important to understand these concepts about what your advantages are and how to exploit them. So Jeff goes for a hatch on 12 in main base. Huge focus on larva. Definitely not going to have fast zerglings. Definitely not going to have more gas than the opponent. Hatch 12, pool 11, gas 10. Rebuild three drones. Now here's the weird thing that Jeff does. Jeff also gets a creep colony. On one hand... This gives one clear immediate benefit. If my opponent nine pooled, I gotta get this to stay alive. I must. It's very easy to just outright lose. But this is gonna set up Jeff to be able to long term have a counter attack advantage because Jeff is now protected from Zergling counterattacks because he literally has a Sungan colony right here. And following this, Jeff gets a layer as fast as possible. So. This this is such a weird ass opening. Um, I, th I I think I would say that um, you know if someone was doing like nine pool ultra fast um, mutilisk and really knew how to play against this, I would probably say the one hatch still has an advantage against this by quite a margin. But let's just think, what are the advantages here? We always need to be asking this, right? Like if we are up against this. Well, Jeff is not going to have faster Zergling speed. Jeff is not going to have more gas. Jeff is going to basically have slower everything and less of everything except Zerglings. And because Jeff went for this very fast um, extra hatchery with lots of extra drones, Jeff can actually produce off all of these larvae. So what Jeff is essentially completely pinning his opening around, it is getting lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of Zerglings. It is like a super Zergling focused opening. Um, Jay Yun was doing that modern opening where you get the pool and the geyser and then you expand and then you get the layer. Um, in Jay Yun's shoes, the, the sort of weird answer is you need to devalue Mutalisks value way more drones, including a sunken colony, and then sort of play out like you're against a one-basing player, or excuse me, a one-hatchering player, but like in slow motion. So you need to get quite a lot more drones. Drones is the correct response if you're Jay on here, followed by a sunken colonies. Just one. One sunk behind an evo chamber. My little silver cat is leaning against me. It makes me, makes me very happy. You're a good cat, Despy. So, in control, very intelligently waits until his speed is getting close to complete before moving out. This is such a risky place to build a spire because if there's any blocking here, drones will pop out here and then make their way around. <laughs> Happens to everyone, but other than that, you know, it's a little vulnerable to ling attacks, but that's still fine. Jeff is just building as many lings as he can. And look at this angle. Here's something super important. In control, 
has an overlord at the front. Has an overlord that's just finished at his own front, and another scouting overlord that hasn't made any headway. Ordinarily, this would be very bad. Why? Because there's ordinarily not a sunken colony here. But with the sunken colony, this is a very good move. In control, could actually slip behind enemy lines and deal a shitload of damage to drones. And that would be great, because Jeff is going to have two more hatcheries pumping out all sorts of units. It's a great move. This is... It's almost like an invisible tactic. Until you've played enough Zerg vs. Zergs where you've tried to do this and then just died, this might not even be on your radar. Jayon has positioned his Zerglings forward, so Jeff can't do anything out of it, but that's great. That's a fan, fan, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic thing. And Jayon is, I honestly think, a little bit, like, just befuddled. Like, what, what is this opening, you know? I think Jayon's seen the sunken colony. I, I don't even know. I don't even know. I could rewind and find out, but we have a lot more games to watch today. So, Spire's coming up. More Zerglings continue to be produced. Look at the gas for Jeff. Does not quite have enough to just pump out a bunch of Mutalisks. This is where Zerglings scourge off this fast two hatches. Really, really cool. So with very large Zergling numbers, Jeff can push forward. Little bit of Miss Micro by Jayun, and then just Jeff waits for these really great concave angles and just barges right on in there. Gets these surround angles. So this is this is pretty nightmare situation if you're if you're Jay Young. But let's look at some of the tactics that are going on here. Why does Jeff split up? Why does he have a few links stay here and a few links go here? Well, because there's two locations to defend. And Jeff has this counterattack advantage, so Jeff can spread out, do almost whatever he wants with his units. Man, he doesn't even have anything to defend. It's awesome. And drones die stupidly fast. Now, what would really slow this down? Well, probably not Zerglings. Jeff's got enough Zerglings. This is where these Ling Scourge tactics come in. Jeff is not trying to dump all his cash into air yet. He's building a few extra Scourge to be able to reinforce this. But Jay on GG's out anyways. This is a little bit of the same as the last game that we saw out of Jadon, but you can see that there's follow-ups here. And you can also see the sort of pain, the anguish of being Jay on in this spot. You have 700 gas. Never got to see the light of day because of these Zergling tactics. I want to look at some more, um, one more mirror, or one game that's a little bit more about mirrored. Uh, gameplay. And th this is kind of a weird opening, but again, all openings can be understood by thinking about the relative advantages that you have. This is uh, another game. This was the final game between Yarnsi and Jadong when Jadong won the OSL. And this map is Heartbreak Ridge, which has, excuse me, Despy Cat, which has only one entrance and only two starting positions. If I actually go to the entire map, if you look outside the front, here's your small entrance, here's your large entrance. And so the, the fastest way between two bases is like this down, through the middle here, and then down this way. So let's look at the ways that Jadong, both players are going to do the same thing. But let's look at how both players are able to do this. All right, so, Overlord's moving out. This opening, you're gonna maybe half recognize. This is a style of opening, a sort of framework that I really like to make, uh, which is right as your Overlord's about to finish, you build a gas and a pool at just the same time. And then you start making drones. I like doing this if I'm doing a one hatch play quite a bit. But let's stop and think for a moment. This spawning pool was pretty quick. An overlord, and then boom, a pool as fast as possible after that. So this overlord, 
pretty much would be, like, seeing Zerglings move down if there was, like, a four pool or something. So, probably not a four pool. Probably not a four pool. Now is about when a nine pool would be done. And we're still not seeing any Zerglings. So, in a moment, we're still willing to say probably not a nine pool. Probably not a nine pool. Probably not a nine pool. Again, still not seeing anything. And so Jadong does this really cute thing where he keeps building drones. He still puts two in gas. And actually keeps building drones because his overlord now is parked right over the only entrance. So at this point, Jadong, even though he went for a very fast pool and then a very fast layer, Jadong's going, oh my gosh, all right, I'm sort of you know, scot free. There's there's no there's no stuff coming. There's no links coming. Still see no links, still see no links. And so Jadong sneaks a little hatch over here. Now, why over here? Th don't do this if you're playing. Just build this hatch here like a normal dude. This is this super high level stuff that's designed to throw off this scouting overlord. The scouting overlord's gonna come in there, not see that there's a hatchery, and then misplay. But don't, don't do that. Hilariously enough, Yarnsey's doing the exact same thing. So there's two Zerglings coming out. Overlord from Jadong sees that this is what's happening. And it's real easy if you're clicking on your own stuff and going, Hey, my hatch was built like the same time as your hatch. My layer's done, and it looks like it's a little faster than your layer. Mm, looks like we're doing something pretty similar. Is your layer going to be done soon? Oh, it is? You know, we, we might be doing the same thing. And then you literally keep your eyes locked here and just see what's coming out of eggs, man. So Jadong sees a few lings coming out of eggs. Oh, shit. Maybe I should make a few drones because if, if I'm Jadong, I can count. I got eight. I can go to Yarnsea and I can count one, two, three, four. I can count ten. Whoops. Nine now. So it's pretty easy to do counting in this game because the numbers are not higher than 10. And as we know, Twitch chat has never counted higher than 10 before. Oh my god, Day9 is so savage. Oh my god, he's such a bastard. Um, when I was a younger, dumber, worse Zerg player, here's what I used to do. I used to freak out and be like, ooh, maybe I'll cancel Zergling's speed so that I can get more Mutalisks. Woo! Um, I, I used to be so uncomfortable in spots like this where we're both doing the same thing. Everything of these two players is almost identically mirrored with one exception. You'll see it says 4264 gas mined. And you'll see there's almost 500 here. 4440. Jadong has mined less gas. So by all metrics, we would say that Jadong is slightly behind. He's behind about two Mutalisks worth of gas. Well, let's just watch how amazingly good Jadong is. Neither player's actually built a lot of Zerglings, so no one's willing to do that many tactics with Zerglings. So, Spire finishes. Jadong immediately builds three Mutalisks and then one Scourge. And then almost immediately thereafter, Jadong just fires a drone right on down to his expansion. He's going to keep making uh, Mutalisks. But, you know, if we're doing roughly the same thing, man, I'm just I'm just going to expand. Jadong moves down here with his Mutalisks. Just make sure that there's no weirdness happening here. Two Scourge. Cross map for Jadong. Just trying to pick off a Mutalisk. A nice little value play there. And then, great. And the... Ugh. Expansions down. You've heard me talk about this two gas thing being really, really important. Well, let's look at the way that the rest of the map is going to function here. So you'll see Jadong actually has a pretty good spread of overlords. You're allowed to do this if you feel like your mutalists can quickly get to all the important places. So, for instance, here, Yarnsey is pressuring this a little bit, but Jadong's mutalists are there to meet. So Yarnsey backs off. Scourge getting produced. Now, what... 
what advantage can you think of that Jadong might have? Obviously, he has this earlier expansion. So do we just sit there? Do we just kind of lie around? Eh, well, you know, frankly, I'd kind of want to. <laughs> right? Jadong's not doing anything too dramatic because he doesn't have an obvious edge. So he's not going to force it. He's not going to do what young, dumb Sean might do and just start marching over there trying to make magic happen. Yarnsey's in a very similar position. Yarnsey's going like, well, okay, I guess I'll just expand really fast. This is something that happens very often if you are in a mirrored situation. You might be going nine pool versus nine pool. You might do what happened in this game, which was weird second hatch into fast spire. You might both be going 12 hatch in main base. If you ever see that you're doing kind of this pretty much identical thing to your opponent, calmly expand. Don't freak out. Don't send things cross map. Be in defensive positions. Spread your overlords out. And just calmly play. What Jadong does here is pretty marvelous, right? He's just, he's just building Mutas, building Scourge. But there's this really key benefit you gain when you have more gas. Which, in a, in a general sense, it's the numbers thing I've been talking about so much. You know, it's, it's generally that you'll have, you know, 12 mutalisks and he'll have 8 mutalisks and you'll win. But think about that more mutalisks relationship in terms of the absolute numbers. If I have 40 mutalisks and you have 36 mutalisks, I can see the 36 winning. I can see some weird target firing happening, the way the glaives bounce. You know, I can see the 36 winning. And obviously, if you get to really huge numbers, if it's 100 mutalisks versus 96 mutalisks, we'd say that that's kind of like the same thing. But if it's 12 mutalisks versus 8 mutalisks, suddenly, because the absolute numbers are lower, the relative distance between those two numbers is much bigger. And hell, if you're at 6 mutalisks versus 2 mutalisks, that's huge! In other words, if you are starting to get a gas advantage, and you have good micro, which you will if you're playing a lot of ZVZ, you need to start attacking. You need to start leveraging the fact that you have more, that you have a, a kind of a window here. Because if you are at 12 to 8, and you let the numbers go up, you no longer have that advantage of gas. Relatively speaking, you are ahead by 50%, and now you're maybe ahead by 5%. So what often will happen is you'll see someone do what I was talking about in the core strategy episode. You'll see a bunch of Scourge get made because the Scourge can spend the gas. You'll see Jadong's total resources are at zero. And this is to ensure that Jadong can actually begin to do some tactics. What are some of the other tactics Jadong does? Well, he's going Scourge and Zergling. He's using all the larvae out of all of these. Yarnsey, on the other hand, is playing much more mutalisk and drone focused. He's just trying to build mutas, trying to build drones, trying to play protectively. Three links here. Now with all these links and scourge and mutalisks, you gotta be real worried about counterattacks, right? You don't wanna move out and just lose a bunch of stuff in your main. So look, zergling on the bottom side, zerglings sweeping underneath. Overlords, more zerglings up along the top side. Some small sets of zerglings even farther up. All the Muta Scourge in the middle to reinforce whatever needs it. Overlord Spotter is on this top side. The only area where there's not anything is right here. There's almost certainly not going to be two control groups of Mutalisks bombing in to try to kill this off for um, Yarnsey. If this does happen, if Yarnsey bombs in here with all his Mutalisks, you know what Jadong does? Jadong just goes this way. <laughs> just kills everything. Uh, and then we just kind of have a weird looking game, uh, which which will happen. But here, Yarnsey has over 12, Jadong has under 12, but Jadong has a lot of Scourge. Here, doofy little uh, Ling exchanges. And this is a very interesting fight because Yarnsey has five Mutalisks, Jadong has six. I mean, it's very close. Scourge are coming in from both. Jadong just didn't bring these Zerglings in. Oh, I didn't mean to click that button. Both wind up in, in essentially a neutral interaction. But let's look at the way that Yarnsey begins to rebuild. Yarnsey is building 
more Mutalis to try to catch back up in Mutalis count. Jadong starts building drones as well. Did Jadong actually skip Zergling speed? Oh my god. That's sacrilege, man. That is so embarrassing. I, I don't think you should ever do that, man. Either way, more Zerglings getting produced. And you'll see it's kind of like just Mutalisks on this side, plus some drones. And yeah, Jadong's getting Mutas and drones too. But then Jadong reinforces with a lot of Zerglings, a lot of Scourge. Jadong's still making Lings and Scourge to try to leverage this edge that he has. Now we have one of the most simple ass attack moves ever. Here we have ugh, nine brown mutas. Here we have 11 orange mutas. But the brown ones got some scourges. Pretty even fight. But Mr. Jadong also has some zerglings that he is going to be blasting into the front. Lings in one location, mutas in another. 10 mutas versus 8 mutas because Jadong had better connections with his Scourge. And with almost even armies, but Jadong setting the pace because Jadong was the one actually building more total larvas worth of units. He's building more Scourge, he's building more um, Zerglings, and he's bombing in. Just simple tactical outclassing. You know what's amazing? Remember that first Jadong game where we saw Jadong win with a bunch of Zerglings and we went back home, there were Spore colonies being built? And we were like, damn, this was not purely all in. He still had stuff going on on the backside. Well, Jadong just won on the front with Zerglings, won at the back with Mutalisks, and was taking a third base. I mean, this is just like... Jadong is considered the greatest Zerg vs. Zerg period. Just like, of all time, by a wide, wide margin. I mean, it's like, Jadong's the best Zerg vs. Zerg. We don't even care about the rest of the list because there's no such thing as Zerg vs. Zerg comparable to Jadong's. It's just really, really solid. Really, really smooth. Let's see here. Let's look at some... Uh, this game. This is an interesting game. Um, let me go back to it. We're going to see... Uh, some more of the same out of by hero. This is Calm, Intercalm, a uh, very strong Zerg player who um, I almost want to say played a very blunt style a lot of his games, where he would not be as finesseful and sexy with micro using Mutalist like Jadong. He just would have very, very, very good decision making, very good lurker placement, things like that in his other matchups. Uh, and his Zerg Reserve was never spectacular. I mean, obviously, he's a pro gamer, so Zerg Reserve is like insane but what do you know we're seeing this opening style that we saw jeff do we're seeing it out of uh calm calm's gonna do it a little different building up drones you're seeing this nine pool pops out they're hanging out they're chatting their buddies it's all good Calm plays this game out very, very weirdly. What advantage does um, Calm has? Calm very clearly has a larva advantage going on. Super, very, ultra clearly. Remember how I said that Jeff built that early uh, sunken colony because against nine pools, you can counter problems. We have a cross map nine pool still arriving early. And. Watch this, this is a really cute move. This is a great tactic by Hero. You literally park your ass right here in front of the eggs so you can get all sorts of free hits. Chillin', chillin'. Wh where did this. Where the hell's the other Zergon? Because there's five. Here's two. What the hell is this guy doing? What was that? Oh, yeah, that's right. I guess he was spreading himself out to be able to track down stuff. One drone goes down. Two drones go down because drones die super fast in this matchup. Nine drones. And this is this is a... I, I am fascinated by the way that Calm plays this game out. He just tries to expand off this. And I, I actually think that this is in some ways possible. You have so much larva. You're going to have three hatches worth of larva versus one hatch worth of larva. 
but you're not going to have essentially any anti-air, <laughs> except for spore colonies. So the idea is that you would apply so much pressure, so much so, that you'd either win outright, or you'd be able to drone up sufficiently to protect your expansion. So you're seeing Hero with the same kind of moves, constantly pulling back, constantly pulling back. Layers getting built by Calm. Calm has rows of drones flooding in. I think in Calm's shoes, you might very well have to. Ooh, damn. That was painful. That was so painful. So there's this funny thing about these formations like this. If you have little arcs with your Zerglings, this is amazing. Your little Zergling arc will absolutely dominate larger numbers of Zerglings. Unless there's a small hole in it. Now, you let your opponent get an arc on you, because they can cut down across that point, and when they're attacking on the point, they're naturally going to get a better wraparound. Yeah, I really think the big thing Calm did incorrectly was put three in gas here. And then not get these creep colonies quite up quickly enough. <laughs> here it just goes into the main base. This is not a lost situation, by the way. Truly, truly, it is not. One drone here, but there's like a lot of drones here. Twelve, maybe more. And there's still seven drones back in this base. And Hero can't even risk moving these Zerglings out, because there's just so many Zerglings that could be coming. Oh my god, he hits him with a question mark. I would say that Hero barely won this game, because if these Spore Colonies get up any sooner... It's hell. So Hero's probably just going to build more Sunken Colonies here. This... Typical Zerg vs. Zerg, man. Games are violent, fast, and quick. Um, I'm going to watch... This is just a general game from some top Zerg players. Let's see here. What was the good one? Uh, it was just for you versus Gibbon. It's going to be a good amount of typing in this game, but uh, not not this much. But there's going to be conversation that happens. So this is Terror, very strong Zerg player against Gibbon, who is not a pro whose name I initially recognized, but Neox is a very 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 good clan. Uh, so. He's no doubt super good. So, this winds up with kind of an interesting mirrored style opening. Where you can sometimes play risky and build a hatch on your low ground. But you're very, very vulnerable to nine pools. This is just an open faced risk. You can defend against nine pools, but it's, it's tough as hell. I don't even recommend doing this. It's just so hard. You have to, like, pull a bunch of drones. You cry, but that's okay. You know that you have way more overall resources. So both players are going 12 hatch, 11 pool, 10 gas. And there's some interesting things that emerge out of these overlord scouting patterns. You'll notice that this overlord moves out to where zerglings could be coming in and then moves down. Overlords move to the edge of where creep would be, and then move away again. Both players still don't really know what's happening. They're just in the dark. And so, Zergling speed started for blue. Layer first, but Zergling speed immediately thereafter. Same thing in Camp Red. And there's, there's really no ramp to rely on. You do not have the opportunity to, say, have a small number of Zerglings in a semicircle that prevents your opponent from having more lings run up. Everyone's going to be on low ground, so you really see these big ling mass-ups begin to occur. Terror is moving forward to try to see... Well, Terror actually almost has Zergling speed up. Let me click on this because the production tab's incorrect a lot of the time. They're both pretty close to Zergling speed. Ah. 
but you're not seeing these extra hatcheries just flood out lots of drones and do stuff like that. I mean, it's it's Zergling production, man. Things are almost twice as stressful in these spots because if you build, like, three rounds of drones, your opponent is going to have two hatches of larvae just trying to punish that. So often in these moments, it's extremely difficult to find an opportunity to stop building Zerglings. Like, extremely difficult. What Blue's trying to do is Blue's trying to set up a larger semicircle like this outside the front. And frankly, I prefer to be in Red's position here because if I'm Red, I can know that I'm covered in the front. Whereas if I'm Blue, there could be Zerglings that kind of slip around down here and like run up into my main base. That could be that could be really bad. Despite the two hatch, eight drones, not seven, but eight this time. Ah, economy. I actually think it's the exact same for both of these players. Yep, eight and eight. Feeling great. So here's where we see some really interesting Zergling micro happen, where Gimmin is going to want to pull away from anywhere where he doesn't have a concave. Like, this is an amazing concave. Look at all these Zerglings that were able to attack those two. And same thing for Blue. Blue wants to pull out of here and try to rescoop in here. So red has the far better angle here. Like, way far better. These Zergling concave battles are quite vicious. So then you see the seesaw motion happen. <laughs> it's hard to find an opportunity to build Mutalisks. This is some of the derpiest stuff. But... That is Zerg Berserk. This is a horrible concave for red. Blue is going to massively get the better hand on this. And blue pulled back. I'm not exactly sure why. Don't use hold positions on your Zerglings unless you are at the top of a ramp. Because you will get completely surrounded and obliterated. So at this point in the game, you're seeing that the, these expansions have not really had the opportunity to do that much. Red is continuing to try to, like, maybe plow forward with just continued Zergling production, but eventually one of, one of the players will wind up breaking and falling really far behind and then has to keep rebuilding Zerglings, as Red has here. Beautiful concave. The, this is actually one of the reasons why I go for one-hatch plays so much of the time. I just hate these matchups. I hate going mass zergling versus mass zergling for super long periods of time. I just want to get to something with variety unit interaction where I can actually do some tactics as opposed to just like one arc and that's done. So as both players sort of hit a, a period of truce, red is thinking, well, I overbuilt a bunch of zerglings. I'm going to still see if I can slip in. Very common to do things like this. You move to the sides, spreading out, trying to get away from the mutalisks. Try to hide the zerglings. Try to go in at other angles. And interestingly, Red has some chance to maybe step forward and try to be aggressive, but this is where things start to calm down a bit and become quite a bit tense. Where blue needs to pull overlords back all around on these sides. Same with red. Red needs to start spreading some overlords around here. Not too far away. Moves like this are very dangerous. But... Um, I would say that this is a little more dangerous for red than it is for blue. Because blue just killed off a bunch of red zerglings. But, I mean, if more Zerglings swept up here, uh, that could be a little messy. It's hard to have two bases, man. It's hard to get these set up. Let's speed this game up a teensy bit. So now we're sort of in a weird position, where Terror is pretty darn sure that he has more Mutalisks, and he's getting his Gas Geyser and feels at least like he is even in terms of the timing of this Gas Geyser. 
So if you're Terror, the advantage that you're pretty sure you have is an air advantage. That's the big one. You don't know if you are up against almost no Zerglings. It's likely, but you don't know that. You just know you won an air battle down here. And this got up pretty quickly. And so I think that this type of move is great. Look at these overlords calmly moving all the way out. Spreading forward, trying to find anything counterattacking that's there. Be real careful not to have your Scourge crash into overlords. This is not good. So red literally just out micros here. Red just picks off all those Scourge so amazingly. And red manages to get two Zerglings over here. Super small numbers of Zerglings. There's one Zergling killing a drone. Almost killing another one in the main base. This little Mutalisk was the poor result of a rally point gone wrong. So this is where there's a bit of a deadlock. It feels a bit like if you're red, you can't really do too much. You don't really have any Zerglings. And blue has his tactic very clearly planned, which is just apply pressure wherever the second gas geyser is. Sweeping around to just kill anything. Supplies are super low, so there's not really a good way to just bounce back from losing an Overlord or two. And this puts Jimin in the really uncomfortable position of having to go Scourge Mutalisk. You have to just burn all your gas as best you can and hope that you can Scourge Micro better than your opponent can. Again, still going to be building Mutalisks as best he can, but... Right now, blue is slowly getting more and more ahead. So the only real way that red can get back in this game is by bombing in with some Scourge. And getting some really nice engagement, although that one was really weird. What is the Scourge doing? Alright, I gotta get the Mutalisk count. So it's 9 versus 8, but there's some Scourge coming in. Oh my gosh, two Zerglings moving in. It's kind of amazing how just like two Lings can completely disrupt the economy. Like everything is a crisis. And I love this, just pulling back, picking off a single drone. But at this point, I think that in all these little exchanges, um, I think the sort of key highlight point is that both players are looking for opportunities to engage and to be aggressive. They're looking for chances to find fights, to get edges in fights. Red was not paying attention for a moment there. Oh. Uh. Four versus six. So somehow, like, Red's gotten ahead in this one, but I didn't see any other lanes that slip by. But dude, like, in these deadlocks, just like two Zerglings can just destroy everything. All right, things are finally calming down a bit. Uh, we're getting to 40 supply. So this is this is late game. <laughs> and just getting a single round of lings in here is great. It's a similar concept to what we saw in Jadong versus Yarnsea, where you don't just build only Mutalisks. You want to certainly build the Scourge to keep your gas count low so that you can engage. And then you want to build the Zerglings to do some extra tactical moves while the Mutalisk versus Mutalisk fights are going on. Because they're so micro-intensive that you can't really split your uh, attention. But Red has completely ruined everything by standing still. If you stand still, you just eat Scourge. And now Blue's ahead. <laughs> this is pretty tradey. This is very rare to have this go on. Normally one player gets ahead in Mutalisk and then just continues to control well and wins. There's been a mixture of nice micro and some clumsy biffs on both sides. 
They're making this incredibly entertaining to watch. Here he goes. I like these overlords here on the top side of the map. It's not moving. Ah. Uh, uh. Kill this one. Kill this one. No! N a pair of Zerglings! You know, this is one of these weird games where I don't. there's not, like, a lot to say. Because there's not new things happening. Like, I've said the same shit, like, five times in a row now. But... That does make it a really great game to illustrate that key point. Hard to make drones. Easy to kill drones. Ugh. That was well done. Oh my god, one Zergling! It's already gotten one kill. Alright, there's six drones mining here. One drone mining here. Eight drones mining here. One drone mining... Oh my gosh, Red has such a better economy. What will we do? Finally, they just decide to man fight. Man fighting is when you just stop microing your mutilus and you're like, alright, I'm going in. Somehow Gimmin has come out on the top of that clumsy ass exchange. No upgrades versus I think no upgrades, yep. That's when mutas and links start coming at the same time. So fragile. Here's the game ending moves. Dude, if I were red, I would have just chilled there, man. I would have just killed every last drone. And that's the game! So there's a lot of one-hatch shenanigans. A lot of expanding, but not building any drones there in order to just make sure that you can stabilize with Zerglings. And then after that, it's this huge struggle to even get to 40 or 50 supply. I think we only had one game exceed 50 supply the entire day. And so much of what makes Zerg vs. Zerg interesting is understanding when you have more Zerglings, when you have less Zerglings, when you have more Mutalisks, or the potential to get more Mutalisks or not, when it's important to build a Sunken Colony back home versus a Spore Colony. If your opponent has more Lings, you have less Mutas. Uh, if, you, if your opponent has more Lings and you have more Mutas, build Sunks back home. If you have more Lings and almost no Mutas, build Spores back home. Or build nothing back home and just counterattack with Zerglings to buy time for your Mutalist to get up. Um, it's a game where I feel like openings only really last for like three minutes. And then you have to really judge relative to your opponent where your edge lies. And then just sort of focus on that. So that's actually going to be it for... I'm not going to do anything this week or the week after. But when I'm coming back, the next episode will be on the... 20th since I am gone. I'm literally not even in the country. Uh, so I hope you play some StarCraft, have some fun there. And uh, if you're in the mood for a non StarCraft treat, I'm playing Celeste tomorrow. Ooh. Ooh, that's going to be great. But hopefully, your Zerg for Zergs go well. Thanks for watching. Have a great night and a good afternoon and all things positive in your life. <laughs>